Beloved, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Beloved, in the hustle and bustle of this beginning of Advent season, it is easy to get swept up with the business of preparing our homes for guests, visiting friends and families, and finding the perfect gift for our loved ones. But let us take a moment to slow down and remember what Advent is meant to be, a time of waiting for the coming of Christ. Let us pray. Most merciful God, you sent your only Son to redeem the world. Guide us during this Advent season to wait in joyful and hopeful anticipation for the coming of Christ. May you help us prepare and make straight the path toward Jesus. Help us to keep him at the center of all that we do during this special time of the liturgical year. We ask all of these things in Jesus' precious name. And the people of God said, Amen. Let us now stand and sing for our processional hymn, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. Please remain standing and read along with me the statement of faith on page one. We believe in you, 
O God, eternal spirit, God of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and our God, and to your deeds we testify. You call the worlds into being, create persons in your own image, and set before each one the ways of life and death. You seek in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. You judge people and nations by your righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Savior, you have come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to yourself. You bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. You call us into your church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship to be your servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in passion and victory. You promise to all who trust you forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice, and your presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in your realm which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto you. Amen. dear family. The hanging of the green. We call this service this morning the hanging of the green because traditionally evergreens have been used to emphasize the nativity. Green represents renewal, new life, freshness, and rebirth. Today we come together to prepare for the birthday of a king, King Jesus. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. This is also the first Sunday of the Christian calendar, which always begins with our preparation for the Advent, the coming of the Christ child. The season of Advent is a time for us to renew our faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Christmas is the greatest of all the Christian festivals. Christmas is celebrated all over the modern world through the observance of both religious and secular customs. It's no wonder that we decorate our beautiful sanctuary and our homes with evergreen during this blessed season. This season reminds us of the life that was and is evergreen, ever alive. Our hanging of the green service this morning is an opportunity for us to prepare our hearts through scripture, song, and prayer as we adorn this sacred space with beautiful decorations for the full and proper appreciation of this greatest season of the year. Let us rejoice greatly.
all the four weeks before Christmas Advent, a word that means coming. In a way, Advent is not unlike the season of Lent. It anticipates a great event to come. As we ponder anew and anticipate the celebration of Christmas, we can think of this coming in three ways. First, the season of Advent recalls to us that God has come in the form of a baby, wrapped in cloth and laid in straw. God's own child has come to us. Second, the season of Advent fills us with a sense that God is yet with us in word and spirit, the Holy Spirit about which we witness and for which we live day to day. Third, the season of Advent invites us invites in us the excitement and the anticipation of the way in which God will come again in times to come and at the end of time. Even as we celebrate the coming of the Christ, we are reminded that the coming is not yet complete. There is more to come. Candles has been a part of religious worship for centuries. The Hebrews burn candles for eight days is part of their feast of lights. Through the ages, many religious groups have used lights to symbolize truth and revelation. Jesus has been referred to in the New Testament as the light of the world. So lighting the candles has become an important part of our Christian worship. Church leaders have used candles to symbolize the light of Christ shining throughout a sin-darkened world. In our own weekly worship services throughout the church year, we light candles to symbolize these very concepts. As we light these candles today, we symbolize the coming of Jesus Christ into this world of sin and evil, war and strife, stress and turmoil, suffering and death. Jesus came to bring hope and to help those who were held captive by oppression and to guide them to peace and joy throughout the illumination of his message of love of God.
This color represents the purity of Christ. The tr traditions we observe for this Advent season designate the lighting of the first candle to represent hope for the celebration of the coming of Christ. The second candle reminds us that we enter a season of peace during this season, like no other, we strive to be at peace with others. Joy is the theme of the third candle. We await again the joy Christ brings to the world. The love of God available to all mankind is represented in the lighting of the fourth candle. The culmination of the event, Advent season comes on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day as the Christ candle is lit. We rejoice in the fact that the promise of long ago has now been fulfilled. Today, on the first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope. We praise you, O God, God, for, for his evergreen ever crown that, that marks our days of preparation of Christ's Advent. As we light the first candle on this wreath, rouse us from sleep that we may be ready to greet our Lord when he comes with all the saints and angels. Enlighten us with your grace and prepare our hearts to welcome him with joy. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain and whose day draws near. Amen. Beloved, I want to invite all of you now to prepare yourselves for prayer. This special moment and powerful time in our worship is when we gather together as the people of God to pray together, to lift up our deepest concerns to God, knowing that God hears our voice and that God will speak to us and speak to our hearts. One cannot help but be moved by the feeling that the saints are in this space right now. As we heard the grandchildren of Shadar and Legale introduced themselves to us. Her spirit, Legale's spirit, is here. It's in this space. To see Brother Johnson and to think about his parents who helped to shape us and to get us to this moment, it's powerful to me that we're still here and that we're able to testify. Jay's spirit is here right now. I ask all of you now to pray not only for yourselves, but for those who need to be prayed for and prayed over. I ask you to pray because God wants to hear from you. And that opens the door that God can speak to you and to us. We mourn the loss of Tony Waller, and his spirit is in this place, but we're reminded that our children, our legacies continue. The light continues. That's what Advent is about. Ever green, ever life, ever living. Let us pray. Most merciful and ever loving God, sometimes, Lord, it is it's hard to have hope when we've suffered loss of one type or another, when it seems like our cup is overflowing with tragedy and darkness, when our world seems to be upside down and those who seem to be in power seem to have no love in their hearts. Sometimes, Lord, it's hard to have hope. But Lord, we believe that when we come to you in prayer, this is your opportunity to restore hope in us, to remind us that you are still our God, that you brought us from a mighty long way that you're not done with us yet. Lord, hear our prayers this morning because even as we approach the Christmas season, 
We think about those things that are undone in our lives. We think about the things that are broken and need mending. That's why we pray, Lord. We ask that you might hear our prayers, that you might mend the brokenness, that you might put us back together, remember us, put us back together in a way that you would be pleased. And Lord, even as we grieve, remind us of the faith that we profess, that nothing, not even death, separates us from your love, no matter how low we go, your love binds us. Lord, bind your spirit to our spirit during this season, that this might be a time that we rejuvenate ourselves and are reminded that there is still work to be done and that even the work is a blessing. Lord, be with this church, be with this community, be with those who are so less fortunate than we, that even as we approach this season, we might be able to be a blessing to someone else. For those that are ill in body or in spirit or in mind or in finances or in relationships or in jobs, Lord, be the physician that only you can be. Fix us, heal us, mend us, and make us after your will. And as we come to this table, Lord, this holy communion table this very day, remind us that we are already victors through Jesus Christ who lived and died and was resurrected for our sakes. Keep us ever mindful, Lord, of that prayer that he taught his disciples in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, will be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power. Continue the adorning of our worship center with poinsettias. This plant blooms at Christmas time in Mexico, where it is known by its native name, Flower of the Holy Night. Legend says that a small Mexican boy had no gift to bring to the Christ child's manger at the village church. As he trudged toward the church, scuffing his feet in the dust of the road, he decided that he could at least offer the holy infant the branches of a bush that grew beside the way. He stripped off some of the branches and made his way to the church, where he reverently placed the green leaves at the manger. As he knelt there, the other children jeered and mocked his offering. Rising tearfully, he looked once more at the branches, only to find that a brilliant red star-shaped flower now topped each branch. In 1829, Joel R. Poinsett, then ambassador to Mexico, brought the flower of the Holy Night back to his home in South Carolina. Today, the poinsettia, named after Mr. Poinsett, is the most popular flower of the Advent Christmas season. Actually, the red petals are not the blossoms, but leaves. There is a small yellow cluster at the center of the poinsettia stalk that is the flower. The combination of red and green leaves 
around this delicate flower reminds us of the life of Christ, the green, life everlasting, the red, the price Christ paid for each of us. of bringing pine, fir, cedar, holly, ivy, mistletoe, and other green plants into the worship center is a part of the Christmas joy. These plants are called evergreens because they do not die. Throughout the seasons of the year, they remain evergreen, ever alive. The spicy fragrance of these evergreen plants remind us even when all else is barren in the winter, that the world God made his promise of reawakening. It was in remembering this that the early Christians in many countries decked their churches with boughs of evergreens as a promise of the new life and as a sign of the assurance that in Christ, all who call on Christ will live forever. Today, we decorate our worship center with the glow and the splendor of the evergreens because of their link through the ages with beauty, endurance, and permanence. As the lily flower, and Mary bore sweet Jesus Christ to be our sweet Savior. The rising of the sun and the running of the deer, the playing of the merry cornets, the singing in the choir. Oh. 
is an alternate to the traditional Christmas tree, many churches now decorate their trees with chrismons each year. The decorations are various symbols from the geneal genealogy of Christ and of his life, death, and resurrection. The term chrismon is a combination of two words, Christ and monogram. The original symbols used only monograms of Christ. Since that time, however, many new symbols have been developed by churches and families around the country. Chrismons are the only colors white and gold. White is the liturgical color for Christmas and also refers to Christ's purity and perfection. God refers to the decorated with tiny white lights to remind us that Christ is the light of the world. The altar guild and the other ladies of First Congregational Church were hand, literally handmade the chrismons that are used on our tree today. A list of the symbols used on the chrismon tree is available through the altar guild. The practice of decorating an evergreen tree in the home or church is a long-standing tradition. The most popular legend concerning the origins of this practice holds that Martin Luther, the great 16th century Reformation leader, was trudging through a snow-filled wood on Christmas Eve and wished that his children could experience the beauty of the stars shining through the lens of the evergreen tree. He decided to try to see and carry it home to decorate his family to symbolize the stars in the Bethlehem Other legends concerning the history of the Christmas tree, but the meaning and symbols represented in all the legends is one of a religious nature. We place evergreen trees in our homes and churches as a symbol and reminder that Christ is ever present and that he is the tree of life. We place lights on the tree to remind us that the Christ child came to earth as the light of the world. We place this Christmas tree in our worship center and in so doing claim its religious significance for us. The Christ who comes is the tree of life.
Isn't it glorious? What a beautiful, beautiful sanctuary. Look about Before you. Before we continue Isn't our worship, glorious? I want to take a moment just to acknowledge all of the hard work that went into making this beautiful moment uh, so special. We want to acknowledge the Altar Guild and the many volunteers from our church that have been working literally for days to dress the sanctuary. Let's give them an applause. When the lights come on, it's like being a kid all over again. It just, just brings all of the wonder and awe of the season. So we thank all of you for your beautiful work. Beloved, this is the time when we can celebrate not only how much God has blessed us, but this is the time when we can testify by being a blessing to others. I invite you now to participate in this worship with the giving of your tithes and offerings. I want you to think, especially at this season when we celebrate our abundance, that many do not have an abundance to celebrate. And this is our time when we can let them know how good and powerful God is by the very giving that we do, by the very living that we do, by the very serving that we do. Today we're going to take a second offering as we normally do for our local benevolences by the diaconate. It's to help those that come and just come in the middle of the week to the church and have no food or no place to stay or no lights on in the house, some place to keep warm. So remember when you're giving, you're giving to change somebody's life. And I just want to thank you in advance for your generosity. Christmas time can be a difficult time. And so someone needs to know that they are loved by the very giving that we do this very day. You will not be attended to by members of the Board of Trustees and members of the diaconate.
Let the church say amen. That was fabulous. Amen. Bring the full tithes into the storehouse. Let there be food in my house, saith the Lord. And thus put me to the test and see if I will not pour out for you an overflowing blessing, so much so your storehouse will not be able to contain it. God, as we enter this Advent season with joy, anticipation, and thankfulness, we are thankful as we await the coming of the Messiah, thankful for what we will enjoy and in, in, entertain as we worship the life, the lessons, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. At the same time, we are thankful for all of the gifts that you have given to us, that we return to you. And we are thankful equally to be giving these gifts with the joy that we have in our hearts, that we know that these gifts will be returned to those who are less fortunate than we through your mercy and joy. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. On this special day, we want to open the doors of the church and say, if you are looking for a church home, we want you to consider First Congregational Church. We have really been blessed this season with some wonderful new members, and we hope we're starting a trend. Looking to any of you that are looking for a community where you can live out your faith to consider First Congregational Church. We believe that no matter what, everyone should be in a community of faith, a place where you can be nurtured and supported, a place where you can grow and be challenged, a place where you can be missed when you're not here, knowing that you are loved and cared for. If today is your day to join us in fellowship, I invite you to come down and stand with me as we sing our hymn of invitation, I Love the Lord. Come join us if you're looking for a church home. This will be a good place for you, I promise.
Amen. I want to invite the congregation to stand now as we prepare for our service of Holy Communion. It's printed on page seven of your bulletins. Page seven of your worship bulletin. Luke the evangelist wrote of our risen Lord that when he was at the table with two of the disciples, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. For the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord God. We give you thanks, Lord God, our Creator, for bringing the worlds into being, for forming us in your likeness, for recalling us when we rebel against you, and for keeping the world in your steadfast love. We praise you especially for Jesus Christ, who was born of Mary and lived as one of us, who lives exactly like we know, and yet was obedient to your purposes, even to his death on the cross. We thank you that you just stamped his death with victory by raising him in power and by making him heir over all things. We rejoice in the continuing presence of the Holy Spirit in the church you have gathered in its task of obedience and in the promise of eternal life. With the faithful in every place and time, we praise with joy Therefore, bless now by your word and spirit, both us and these gifts of bread and wine, that in receiving them at this table and in offering here our faith and praise, we may be united with Christ in one another and remain faithful to the tasks he sets before us. In the strength Christ gives, we offer ourselves to you, giving thanks that you have called us to serve you. Let us bow our heads in prayer. O oh Lord, in this Advent season, create in us a new heart and renew a right spirit within us as we anticipate your coming, as we do year by year. Help us as we do your work in this world. Help to guide our feet, our thoughts, and our hands as we feed the hungry as we give clothes and shelter to uh, those who are in desperate need of it. Lord, also help those who are lonely. Help those who are ill. Walk with them through all of their iniquities. We know, Lord, that all things are possible through you, and there is nothing that we can achieve without your intervention. Lord, we pray this simple prayer in the holy and mighty name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Has everyone been served? 
Beloved, this is the body of Christ broken for you and for your sake. Take and eat all of it. This represents the blood, which is the new covenant of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you. Drink ye all of it. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you in this time of waiting that we can come together as your children and recognize the sacrifice of your risen son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, not just for the ritual, but for the significance of what it means for us to do this together. We ask that not only that it replenish us, but it helps us replenish each other as we go out into the world. All this and more in the spirit of the Holy Spirit that covers us, we say in gratitude, thanks to your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Please remain standing for our service of silence and the benediction. I'm going to ask our pastor, Ambassador Young, to pray the benediction, because uh, sometimes I just need to hear the pastor's voice. And so, Pastor, um, if you would. And the acolyte will come and take the light back out into the world? Yes, the acolyte will. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace and grace and mercy and forgiveness. In his holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs>